Shalom Aleichem, my friends. We will be discussing now some commentaries on Parashat Naso. As you know, the Parashat of Naso will be read after Shavuot, I mean the Shabbat that comes after Shavuot, outside the land of Israel. But this very Shabbat in Israel, we will read Naso. As soon we will come to a final uh, equality. So therefore, I will say a few words about Parashat Naso for all our friends outside the land of Israel. Right now, in Israel, we are in this Shabbat that comes before Shavuot. I mean, Saturday night will begin the holiday of Shavuot, the holy day in which the Jewish people receive the Torah. There must be something to be said about the fact that Parashat Naso on Shabbat that comes before Shavuot is read. First, I would like to share with you a certain information that came from one of the greatest uh, Admorim of Hasidut. He said that the Shabbat before Shavuot has a name, and the name is Shabbat Derech Eretz, the Shabbat of, let's explain what is Derech Eretz. Derech Eretz could be morality, traits of character. Why? It's based, why does he call this Shabbat before Shavuot Shabbat of Derech Eretz? Because our sages said, Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah. Derech Eretz, morality and uh, uh, being a good person, comes before the learning of Torah. Since Shavuot represents the Torah, so Shabbat before is something that comes before. What comes before? Derech Eretz, morality, to be nice to people, to to have gratitude over anything, any benefit that you got, to fix your uh, bad character, I mean to, to think about uh, anger, not to be quickly to anger, also to try to do something about jealousy, which practically is, the, is a destroyer of the human soul and the human body also. Uh, arrogance, and many, many other traits of character that are within the philosophy of Derech Eretz, the way of life. And that comes before the Torah. The Torah, although one who learns the Torah in depth can definitely find in the Torah all the teachings regarding Derech Eretz, but it's not clear. Because the Torah is a, Jew, is, is a book of Jewish law. Chukimu Mishpatim laws and uh, judicial uh, laws, right? Of course, besides uh, the stories of our forefathers before the Torah was given and when the Jewish people were in, in slavery in Egypt, all this has, to, of course, we, we could learn a lot of midot tovot, of good traits of character from our forefathers from Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, but that is only when you learn it in depth, if you are capable. But the truth is that when our sages said, Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah, it comes, Derech Eretz comes before the Torah, it means that when you go to learn Torah, first make sure that you have checked yourself, you have examined yourself. It is so important. Based on that, I always have the tendency to explain what the Talmud says in the very beginning of the tractate of Psachim, in the Mishnah it says, Or li, li, li yudalet, bodkim et chametz. We check the chametz. What is there to check? The way? I never understood that. I mean, the night, I mean, the day before Pesach, I mean, the night before Pesach, that's the 14th of Nisan, the night of the 14th of Nisan, we have to check the chametz. That's not what it should be saying. It should be saying, we look for chametz if there is still any trace of it to destroy it. As we know that uh, Pesach, is, the purpose of Pesach is to destroy any kinds of chametz, 
bread or any similar thing. But here it says, botkim et he chametz. You have to check the chametz. What is there to check? I mean, can you check bread? Therefore, I brought myself to explain that to check the chametz is number one, like the Ari HaKadosh says, that one of the meanings of chametz, why do we have to destroy bread when bread served us so well during all year? Because bread represents all the aspiration, the bad aspirations of a human being that we call Yetzer Hara or Satan. Bread could mean figurative, of course. In a figurative way, it means everything that one desires. So one has to check them, those things that you desire. But check what is wrong with you. Many times people, they could be learned in Torah and everything, but they never check themselves. Did they examine themselves vis-à-vis -vis, uh, jealousy, for example? Did they check themselves whether they had a point of uh, gava, of arrogance, of conceit, or pride that hurts other people? Did you hurt someone? Are you sure you were patient with people? Are you sure you loved people because you understood their needs? As you understand your needs, like the Torah says, here is an explicit Jewish law in the Torah, in the book of Vaikra, in Parashat Kedoshim, where we can learn so much, so many good traits of character. Love your fellow man like yourself. I mean, the words like yourself, kamocha, represents practically all the Torah of good traits of character, of morality. If you understand your fellow Jew as you understand yourself, as you don't want things that you hate or things that hurt you, you don't want them upon you, the same thing also you have to be very careful not to hurt your fellow Jew or your fellow man, wherever he is. And that has to do with checking your chametz, checking that which is negative in you. Many times people are blind over what they really have behind what they portray, you know, they like to portray, let's say if they are uh, good uh, Torah scholars. So they think they can give you advice and everything, and, and why not? Yes, it's possible. But they have to check themselves first. Are they sure that the reason they say what they say is because of truth and sincerity or because maybe there is something there that hurts them something is aching in their systems like jealousy so they think they are giving you an advice where they were in fact they are putting you down now those are things that are very deep uh, it has to do with psychology but we are under the obligation to check ourselves before we learn Torah. The Vilna Gaon says in his famous book, Eben Shlema, he writes that even if you learn all the Talmud, that's a phenomenal amount of Torah, and let's say you master it and you know it, but if you did not pay attention to your traits of character, to your Derech Eretz, to your Middot, you know, the character, to fix your character and all the things that go with it, all the Torah that you have learned mean nothing. That's what the Vilna Gauss, the genius of the Jewish people, that's what he said. Unfortunately, today, especially today, we don't see much of that. Uh, of course, I wouldn't want to, there, there is so many good things, there are so many good things about everyone. I'm not saying that everything is rotten, but there is plenty of rottenness, even in the best of us. And that's why we have to check our chametz. <laughs> this parashat Naso, since we said that as an introduction that Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah, and this Shabbat is known as Shabbat Derech Eretz because, because it comes immediately before Shavuot. So our theme today will be about traits of character. We derive it also from the parasha. The parasha of the week, Parashat Naso, we have 
very important section, a small section which consists of a blessing that the Kohen, the priest, gives us every day, at least as far as the Sephardim are concerned, every day in their synagogues there is what we call Birkat Kohanim, the blessing of the priest, of the Kohen. By the Ashkenazim, some do it, some do it only for, for the holidays. Anyway, that's the, by the way, this is something, even the great Torah scholars, the great people of the generation by the Ashkenazim, they also admit that even Ashkenazim should have a Kohen that gives them a blessing every, every morning. Not only on Shabbat or Yom Tov, or only on Yom Tov. They have to do it every day. Because it's a, those are, the, because Birkat Kohanim represents three laws of the Torah, three commandments. And they miss those commandments, but it's not, uh, I know that they have, uh, uh, thank God, they have a source upon which they can lean. But at least as far as the Sephardim are concerned, we have the blessing of the Kohen every day. He stands near the Hechal, and he, he, he gives the blessing to all the people, the congregation. What does it say in that uh, blessing? There were three verses. It says, number one, uh, God says to Moses, the Beril Aharon, speak to Aharon, your, your brother, who is the Kohen, right? And also his children are the Kohanim. Ko tebarechu et bene Israel. That's exactly how you should bless the people of Israel. Number one, first verse, Yevarecha Hashem, veishmerecha, may God bless you and keep watch over you. Beautiful blessing, right? Our sages added their own understanding. They said, Yevarecha uh, Hashem Bamamon. May God bless you by giving you money. Money is, is a source of uh, comfort. Right? Veishmerecha. And may He watch over you. Our sages add, Min Hamazikin. From those who might harm you. What do they mean? Number one, let's take the word for its uh, facet. The mazikin are the forces of the outside. I mean, devils. The devils, uh, the, we don't see them, but they are present, and they can be jealous from your uh, fortune, and will tr they will try to harm you because of your because you're rich. So the blessing is that may God watch you and uh, protect you from those uh, harmful spirits. But it means also that. Uh, uh, riches could also lead to all kinds of uh, bad things of character, bad traits of character. Our sages said, Gadol nisayon ha'osher yoter min nisayon ha'oni. Greater is the test of riches than the test of poverty. Because riches will make you, is liable to make you become arrogant. That's, some, that's a very, very big no-no in Judaism. To be a man of conceit, and uh, one is not allowed to elevate himself above any Jew, even the smallest Jew. One should not think of himself greater than him. Remember the word kamocha that the Torah says. Exactly like you feel for yourself, that's how you feel for others. Though there is no room for uh, arrogance. Also, uh, money could, uh, could bring you to do things that you were not used to do before. And they might be dangerous, right? Either because of your evil inclination, now you're looking for uh, pleasures that are forbidden that you couldn't do before because you didn't have the money for it. But now you have the money, so you have the possibility. That's also another danger. So, the blessing of the Kohen is that may God give you money. Very important, why not? It's a blessing, but at the same time, He will keep you from the harmful effect of money. And then comes the second verse. The second blessing is, Ya'er Hashem panav elecha v'yehuneka. May God make His presence enlighten you and grant you grace. A very important blessing. Of course, number one, the Kabbalists say that when you hear this blessing, you have to think, May God give you light on your face. When your face shines, it means that you're a happy man. Being happy is very contagious. When you are happy, anyone who's close to you will be happy also. 
It's a very important thing to make people happy. It has to do, and happiness is shown on the face. <laughs> it is true. Veiten lecha yaer Hashem panav lecha. From where do you get that shine on your face if you have it? If you have the merit to have it, from the shine of God Himself. Veichuneka. At the same time, He will give you charm and grace. Sometimes people, they might not be very handsome, and yet there is something there in their face that attracts you. And, and, and vice versa, you could be very handsome, and yet eh, something eh, does not appeal to, to us with him. You are not attracted to this fellow man or fellow woman because there is beauty and there is beauty. Like Esther, Queen Esther. She was not only beautiful, but she has a charm. She had grace. That's why King Ahasuerosh fell all the way before her. Of all the beautiful girls of his empire, only Esther came up on the top. Why? Because, not because of her beauty, rather because of her charm, her grace that God put upon her face. And then the third verse of the Kohen, and that's our theme. I hope we'll have time to, to, to say something about it. Isa Hashem panav elecha, which means, V'yasem lecha shalom, may God direct His providence towards you, great, and grant you peace. That's what we call in Hebrew, shalom nafshi, peace within yourself. Peace within yourself is the, the practical conclusion of this blessing which represents all the blessings in the world. If you have rest and you have peace within yourself, you have everything. Remember what we learned in Pirkei Avot. In Pirkei Avot chapter 4, we learned Ben Zoma Omer. The sage Ben Zoma, ben Zoma said, Ezehu chacham halomed mikol adam who is smart, who is wise, one who can learn from everyone, which means he respects everyone's wisdom. Even a child, you could learn from him. As the Talmud says in Masechet Ta'anid, Even the great Torah scholar says, what I learned, of course, from my rabbis, from my rab rabbis, but I learned more from my fellow Jew, from my friends. But I, I learned even more from my pupils, from my disciples. That means even from a child you should learn something. There is wisdom in everyone. Only you have to find it. And don't you think that you are haughty enough not to consider that there is wisdom even in someone who is lower than you. All right? So Ben Zoma Ser said, you know who is the true wise man? The one who can learn from everyone. We can find something intelligent in every human being, every kind. And then he says, Who is the strong one, the real strong one, is not the one who has biceps and muscles. If you are capable of conquering your own heart, your own desires. There are many things that we have been given liberty and freedom to do anything we want. When, they, when God gave us uh, uh, freedom of, of, uh, of everything, He gave us freedom. To, freedom of choice. So, if practically you want to be bad, you can be bad. Nobody will stop you. You want to be good, of course. It takes a lot of effort, but you can be good. And don't count only on nature. So there are people who are by nature good people, and there are by nature bad people. So, the one who is good people does not, uh, the, the one who has a good nature, he should not be content with that and that's it. He has to do more than his nature. Right? Same thing also with the guy who was born with a bad nature. Let's say he has a temper. So, he has to curb it. It's not easy, but that's the function of life. That's the point. So, therefore, the real champion here is the one who can conquer himself. And then comes the third blessing. I mean, the third saying of Ben Zoma. Who is the true rich man? If you are content with your lot. 
What does he mean? And then he says, Ezeu Mechubad, who is the one who is really honored, I mean, who deserves honors, if you respect others, you will be respected. If you honor people, you will be honored also. Uh, that's the way it is in life. Everything is reciprocal. So, by the way, why did Ben Zoma leave honor at the end? Why didn't he begin with, the, with it in the, in the first place? The answer is because all the aspirations that we have, they lead us towards the biggest aspiration of all, the aspiration of for honors. You want to be rich. Why do you want to be rich? Of course, it gives you many possibilities. But more than anything, you want also kavod, you want honors. A rich man without honors, you don't see that very much. Same thing also a champion, a very strong man. Uh, you, you know, some people, they spend all their life in the gym so that they can have big muscles. Why? Because they want to be honored for their muscles, right? I know people who have escalated the mountain of the Everest and they practically lost their life. Just why? So that they will be known as champion. They will be, they will be given the honors of having, uh, being the one who conquered the mountain. Same thing also with the riches. Same thing also with everything. So therefore, since all the aspirations that we have mentioned lead to one single big aspiration that is honored, that's why he left that to the end. I found that there is another, uh, another state, other statements similar to Ben Zoma. I found them in Masechet Shabbat on page 26, Kaf Vav. And there it says, number one, Rabbi Meir Omer. Rabbi Meir says, Ezehu Ashir, Tanura Banan, Ezehu Ashir, our sages said, who is the true rich man? So Rabbi Meir said, if one has contentment with his money, there could be a difference between Ben Zoma and Rabbi Meir. There is a difference. Because Ben Zoma says, who is the true rich man? One who is content. With him, which, mean, which means, what, what is it that Ben Zoma means? That even if, you are, if your lot is to have been born poor, but if you are content with yourself, it's like if you are rich. You have everything when you, are, when you have happiness in your heart. Rabbi Meir says the same thing. Only what he says, the difference is that he says, we're talking about a rich man, not about a poor man. A rich man, he has money. But does he have peace of mind with the money? Our sages said, The more uh, properties and the more money you have, the more possessions you have, the more worries you have. Uh, by the way, this is a known fact. Of course, people don't think about it. They prefer to be rich, <laughs> and that's it. But they don't realize that riches could lead them to same, some uh, dangerous situations. I'm not saying anything against riches. I, might, I also want to be rich. Why not? I am rich. But uh, I also want like money. There's nobody that says I don't like money. Even little children, the Talmud says that uh, you could attract little children by giving them money. They love money. Money is something that we love. It's called in Hebrew kesef, which means silver, but it means also money. Why is it called kesef? For two reasons. If you know Hebrew, Hebrew well, then you know that kesef is, is, a, is derived from, liot, li, uh, from nichsof nichsaf. When a person desires something very much, in Hebrew we call that unichsaf leze. He desires it more than anything. That's why we call it money, because money is in fact something that people desire more than anything else. Even though what is hiding behind it is the desire for honors, right? To be respected. But it means also something else. Kesef comes from another derivation. It comes from kisufin, which means embarrassment, shame, which means the more ri the richer you are, the more respected you are. But then you have to be more careful, because then if you make a mistake, the shame is bigger. If you were a poor man, okay, you did something shameful, nobody is going to pay attention. But now that you are rich, you become renowned and everything, if you, make, you do something that is not nice, then people will practically disdain you, and the shame is much bigger. 
right? So that's why Kesef could also bring matters that are not desired very much. Still, we want Kesef, no, no problem. But you see the difference between Rabbi Meir and Ben Zoma? Ben Zoma says, everyone can be rich if you, are, if you have peace of mind, if you are content with what you have. Even if you have one slice of bread, and you sleep on the floor, like it says uh, in Pirkei Avot, I don't want to repeat again that statement, Torah. But at the same time, if you are happy, then, <laughs> uh, let me tell you a little story. There was a great Hasid, a great rabbi, by then, he was known as Rabzushia of Neapoli. He was extremely poor. He couldn't be poorer than that. And he had a great brother, Rabbi Elimelech of Lizansk, a very great tzaddik. So there was an individual, a chassid, who came to his Rebbe, Rabbi Elimelech. And he says, Rabbi, can you teach me how to be content with what I have? You know, following the words of Ben Zoma. So Rabbi Elimelech said, go to my brother, Rabbi Zushia. He is very poor, so he will be able to, and he's a happy man. So he might be able to teach you how to be happy with what you have. He went to Reb Zushia. He says, Reb Zushia, I was uh, the, told that you could give me good advice how to be happy with, with whatever I have. So Reb Zushia said, why did you come to me? So the man says, because I heard that you are very poor and yet you are happy. He said, I'm very poor, you're crazy. I cannot give you advice because I feel very rich. So how can I give you advice? Get the point. All right. More there is in that in Masechet Shabbat on page Kafvav. Uh, on page 26. It says, for example, we have um, Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon, the great man who was very rich, by the way, and he had many properties and many possessions, fields and vineyards, everything that you want. And yet he was one of the greatest Torah scholars of, the, of all the generations. Uh, in fact, he, <laughs> well, we don't have the time to tell you all about him, but Rabbi Tarfon, no question about it. His name is a name to be revered. What did he say? You want to know what is the rich man in the eyes of, uh, of Rabbi Tarfon? You might be disappointed. Listen to this. He says, if you have 100 vineyards, you have 100 fields, if you have 100 slaves, servants, that are busy doing the work, then you are rich. Come on, Rabbi Tarfon, you are the master of Torah. You tell us something so, so, so easy to understand. I mean, everyone will tell you that. You have a 100 vineyard. It means you are rich, very rich. But he added one word. That the servants are the ones who take care of, the, of his riches. Which means, if you are a rich man, but you work from the morning till night because you have so much money you want more. Like our sages said, en adam biyado. one does not die without at least half of his desires fulfilled. Because if you have 100, you want, you want now 200. You have 10 million dollars, you want 20 million dollars. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. That's the problem with human nature that Hashem gave us. And Hashem gave us this kind of nature everywhere. Everyone is different in, in a way. But everyone uh, confirms that, no question about it. But he, he gave us this kind of nature so that we come to this world to overcome anything that is negative in our, in our nature. Could have good nature, huh? but that's not enough. If you have good nature, then, then you were born with that. So you didn't do anything for it. But if you can do much more than what your good nature is giving you, then we can appreciate what you do. As I said before, so, how, so this is what Rabbi Tarfon meant. You could be the richest man in the world, but if you are so busy with it, that's not worth anything. If you have 100 servants that take care of your riches, that means you don't take care of, of it at all. You learn Torah all day, somebody else is taking care of your riches. That's another, uh, another explanation here. That means that the riches cannot uh, harm you. Riches cannot provide you with worries. Right? That's the point. I know some rich people, very rich people, 
They begin, they go to their office at 7 o'clock in the morning, they come back home at, at midnight. I have a friend like this that I love very much. There's no way to even convince him that he give a few hours for Torah study. Well, what can we do? Business is so desirable. Money is even more. What can I tell you? And that's what Rabbi Tarfon conveys to us. Rabbi Akiva says something phenomenal. And it has to do with his history also. You know, like, like Rabbi Tarfon. You know, Rabbi Tarfon, he, was, he, has, he has it all. But uh, the Talmud says in Masechet Brachot that Rabbi Tarfon went once to visit one of his fields. For each field he had some uh, man that he was, he was not a Jew maybe. He's known as Aris, a person who is in charge for, for the field. So he went there to see what's going on with his business. You know, sometimes it's okay. The Aris, the guy who was in charge, his servant, did not recognize his master. So he fell upon him as someone who is uh, trying hey, to, to steal something. And he, he started to hit him. Rabbi Tarfon didn't say, I am the master. And he didn't say, I am Rabbi Tarfon, the famed one. But he almost died because of that. He should have told him. But he didn't want to use the crown of Torah, the Talmud says. He didn't want to say, stop from hitting me, I am Rabbi Tarfon. Then he would stop immediately, right? But at least he should have said to him, hey, aren't you ashamed? I am the master here. I'm the boss. He didn't. He doesn't want to enjoy any of his riches. Let the riches be. Like, I'll give you another example. The Talmud says that uh, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, that's Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, the one whom we, is called just Rabbi, the master of all the generations. He's the one who gave us the Mishnah. I mean, he collected all the Mishnayot for many years. He was the richest man in Israel. About uh, 1900 years ago, something like this, after the destruction of the temple. But he was very rich, he was very friendly with the Caesar, right, with the emperor. Before he, and our sages said that he was so rich, Aharureh de Rabbi Atir Mishavor Malka, that even the man who took care of his stable, he had also many, many. Uh, all kinds of uh, animals and uh, things like this, you know. But he has someone who is uh, taking care of everything, as we said. The real rich man is the one who leaves it to others to take care of his riches. So our sages said, even the one who was in charge of his stable was richer than the king of Persia. Imagine. So how much more could he be? His boss, how much, uh, how richer he would be. Our sages tell us that the riches of uh, of Rabbeinu HaKadosh was unbelievable. But he himself, before he passed away, he raised his finger saying, God, you are my witness that I did not enjoy for myself any of the things that you gave me. All I enjoyed was for the purpose of helping the people of Israel. You know, when he goes by, he has to be, to look like very rich and everything because he was in company of, uh, of the authorities, the Roman authorities, the emperor and everything. So he cannot look poor, then he wouldn't have any influence. Otherwise, he said, I have never derived any personal pleasure from everything that God gave me and blessed me with. That's another example. But Rabbi Akiva comes up you know, Rabbi Akiva also became very rich. <laughs> In the beginning, he was very poor. You know, you know the story of Rachel, his wife, who was the, the sole daughter of the richest man of Jerusalem, Kalba Sabua. And because she wanted Rabbi Akiva, who was the shepherd of her, uh, of her uh, father, because of that, she was disinherited. And Kalba Sabua, even though he had only one daughter, Rachel, but he was so angry that he didn't want to have anything to do with, he, with her. And she went and she lived a life in the beginning with Rabbi Akiva, sending him to study Torah for 12 years and then another 12 years. And she stayed and she, she, she got her livelihood by selling her own hair, our sages said. And then Rabbi Akiva became the most famous man in the country. His name was so revered that even Kalba Sabua heard about him, but he didn't know he was his, his son-in-law. Later on, when he heard that he, Rabbi Akiva is his son-in-law, 
He became so proud that he gave all his money to Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva promised his wife when they were in a state of terrible poverty. He said to her, one day I shall give you uh, a golden bracelet in, in which is engraved the, the picture of Jerusalem. That's why it's called the Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, where, like the, the, the famous song, Yerushalayim of Gold, that came from that statement of Rabbi Akiva. What does he say? It's very normal what he said for Rabbi Akiva. He says, you know who is the richest man? The one who has a good wife. A, w a wife who is very good in all her deeds. Number one, she respects her husband. Number two, she wants him to learn, to be free from any other occupation but learning Torah. Number three, she doesn't get angry at him. She gives him an easy life. She helps him in his life. That's called Na'abe Ma'asim. She has also moralities in everything that she does. It was a real tzaddiket, like a righteous woman. This week we, were, we went to visit the house of one of the neighbors, a great rabbi who lost his wife unfortunately, and she was known as a great, she was the daughter of tzaddikim, of righteous people, and uh, she is her, she was herself also a great tzaddik. Her name is Ya'el Bat Sophia. Okay. So, Rabbi Akiva says, you have a, a nice wife, like his wife Rachel, then you are rich. Riches is a matter of how, how you feel about it. As we said, Hasameach Bechelko. And then there is another opinion of Rabbi Yossi, also the same thing he says if you have a bathroom near you, but that's already another discussion. Everyone talks according to his situation and his, uh, uh, how life came to him, how life uh, was given to him by the Almighty God. So that's the point. The, the secret of all this is what we call in Hebrew hakarat hatov, gratitude to be able to be grateful for everything. Let's say you wake up in the morning, you find yourself, I am a Jew. Of course, we have a special blessing for it that we say, a benediction that we say in Eloah Neshama. We say, Baruch Atah Hashem Shalom Asani Goy. Thank you, Hashem, that I, I didn't wake up to be a Goy. I am a Jew. Something to be proud of. Don't say this outside, of course. Keep it to yourself. But, you have to be very proud that you are a Jew. You know, to be a Jew, <laughs> it takes much. It says that the Kabbalists say that in order to be to come back in reincarnate, to be reincarnated as a Jew, you have to wait at least 500 years. Because to be a Jew is not easy. <laughs> of course, that the Judaism does not provide you with comfort only and, uh, and lack, uh, lack of suffering. <laughs> oh, did we suffer? Jewish people suffered a lot. But we have to be grateful. To God first. That's why the first words that we say when we wake up, Thank you, Hashem. So the same thing also with every fellow man. You have to be thankful. A child open the door for you, you have to say thank you to him. And not only to say it with your lips, you have to say it with your heart also. How many people know how to say thank you with the heart? Or to say forgive me with the heart? If people would say with their heart, with sincerity, I'm sorry, everything will be forgiven to them. They miss the boat by not paying attention to this. Hakaratatov, to be able to recognize the fact that you are grateful to everything. We have blessings for every part of our body. We have to be careful. I have a special I have written a special prayer in Hebrew. On a parchment, on, on a piece of parchment that I recite every morning, and I try to cover as much as possible. Of course, how much can we can we cover? We are covered with blessings, with many good things, and most of them we forget. So you have to mention to say, Hashem, forgive me that I don't have, that I didn't learn how to appreciate even the things that I don't feel. Well, that's something to consider very much. So that's what we learn here. If you, have, if you are grateful, then you will be grateful even for a slice of bread. You have a good wife. You are very rich. But you have to show it. You have to be grateful that you have a good wife. You know, most of the tragedies between, uh, between spouses is the fact of lack of gratitude. If 
one teaches himself to be grateful for everything that he sees. And no one is perfect. No one is perfect. But people are looking all, only for the imperfections. And it makes them angry. And uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, we are all in the same boat. But at the same time, our obligations are clear. Look upon the good things and be grateful for it. If one will do, will be grateful to his wife for whatever she does, then there will be no fights, there will be no divorces. Same thing also between nations, there will be no wars. But be grateful for everything that you got. You're alive, be grateful for it. Let's say you are poor, but you are healthy. Be, be, be grateful that you are healthy. Let's say you have a sickness, so be, 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 be grateful that you didn't get the sickness that others have gotten, as we see everywhere. To learn to be grateful for everything, for everything. And if one is grateful to his wife, our sages said, That's Aramaic saying, respect your wives because you will become then, as a result, you will become rich. You want to become rich? Give full respect to your wife. But there is nothing better than gratefulness. Gratefulness means respect, honor, everything, as long as it is sincere. We have to learn the lesson of sincerity. And that's what it says at the end of the blessings of the Kohen. The third verse, which will bring us to the conclusion of our talk, May God make His presence enlighten you and grant you peace. You know, if you do what we said, if we do what we, say, what we said, there will be peace of mind. If you learned the lesson of gratefulness, you will have peace of mind. And then you will feel that you have everything. And by the way, it is possible that you will have everything. As we said. So that's the point. I could have told you also other stories that we find in the parasha of this week. For example, the, the story of the Sota, the woman who was not faithful to her husband. Uh, so, so he takes her to find out. So he would take her to the Kohen, they would give her a potion that comes from erasing the name of God and that powder will be mixed with water and they let her drink that water. If she did not commit anything uh, wrong, then she will become healthy, she will bring children, she will be beautiful, everything. But on the other hand, if she lied and she was not faithful indeed, then that water is liable to make her become extremely sick and even uh, die. Uh, so, to conclude with a story that is brought in the Midrash Rabbah, in Midrash Rabbah it says, Ma'aseh Rabbi Meir. We, we, we mentioned Rabbi Meir, the darling of the Jewish people. By the way, he was beloved by men and women altogether. He was a great Torah scholar, a luminary of the Jewish people. We're talking about someone who lived approximately 1900 years ago. Rabbi Meir, you know, by the way, some say, there are opinions that say that he was the grandson of Nero, that Nero, who apparently, according to his story, he committed suicide before he destroyed with fire, he destroyed Rome, but he converted secretly, and his great-grandson was, maybe his grandson was Rabbi Meir. I don't know, some uh, speculate about that, but that's not the point. Rabbi Meir is known all over by every Jew. And one day, you know, he was giving lectures non-stop. And many women, they love to hear his, his he was so so uh, interesting in his speeches. Uh, one night, he, his lecture was a little bit longer than usual. I think it was the Friday night. One of the ladies there, she could not uh, help it. He was so interesting that she kept uh, listening and she forgot to get up. And she was already late coming back home and her husband is waiting for her why he was gay, where is she? And finally she came back, it was very late. He was so angry, the husband, and he said to her, stay where you are, go spend the night even outside. You don't come back to my house 
until you go and spit on the face of that Rabbi Meir of yours. She cannot do that. On the other hand, where is she going to go? She went to a neighbor, a friend of her. And she spent the night there and she told her the story. In the morning, a rumor spread because the neighbor said something that that's what happened. And Rabbi Meir heard about it. So what is he going to do now? He's not going. If he asks the woman to come and spit on her, uh, on his eyes, she will refuse. So what did he do? In the middle of his lecture, in the day, he started to scratch his eye. Oh, he makes believe that as though he has pain. Is there any lady who can come here and spit in my eyes?